Welcome back to Watchbox Studios. This is Watches Tonight, and I'm your host, Tim Masso. This evening, we talk GPHG 2021 misses, watches that should have been there, new sports watches from high horology brands, and I review the world's most flagrant copycat watch designs in the luxury space. All of that, and of course, I'm sharing your wrist shots tonight on Watches Tonight. We got Sean on the switcher. This is going to be a good evening. I programmed a nerds show. So we did steel watch prices last week. We are going far afield in this episode. I see we've got Watchusiest from Dubai, Marcus T from Germany, many more joining in live. I hope everyone had a happy Halloween this year. Sadly, in my country, the period between All Hallows Eve and Christmas is one of strife, division, and tension. Step aside, Democrats and Republicans. Hold my beer, AP code 1159. Make way, Orange Gatorade, and get over yourself, Dave Chappelle, because the controversy of the season, the home wrecking dispute that will ruin your Christmas dinner and Thanksgiving all in one is peanut brittle. Is it candy or is it a snack? I promise you, between now and Christmas, lives will be lost over this. Naturally, controversy breeds controversy. For instance, does anyone other than your grandma actually buy this stuff? And do dentists conspire to keep it improbably on the market? Tough questions with tough answers. And was every petrified piece of peanut brittle in existence today made during or before the American Civil War? See? Down in Virginia, it was controversial even then. That's my original scholarship on the battle between the Monitor and the Merrimack. Welcome, guys. Okay, let's see who's in the box right now. We've got Dave Opencar, Joe Pinto from Kansas City instead of Louisville tonight, Jason P., Enrique Cassiano. We've got Scott Wexlin from Westchester, Pennsylvania, Philly Watch fan joining in. Craig, go Braves. We've got the World Series here in the U.S. right now. Jason W. P. T. Hi, Tim and team. Sean appreciates that. Pilot Style 123 Space 4 from Germany. We've got Thomas Burnett, Eddie Lansbury, Dylan L. Abraham Stein joining from Michigan. Mirko Stark, Jeffrey Deach, Joe Tyson from Apex, North Carolina. We got Sinkan H joining in from London, staying up late with us. We got Designer Atelier from Aruba. Guys, welcome and thanks for joining. And of course, we got Joan V from Florida, our old haunt in the Watch You Want days. Let's take a look. I asked you answered viewer wrist shots number one. Starting out with Patrick and his Vacheron Constantin 56 visiting Germany's Benrath Palace by means of a Porsche bicycle. Very cool, nice shot, nice bike, nice watch. Well done all together. Cole W pegs the meter with this composed study of his new AP Code 1159 chronograph. It makes an appearance early. Looking good, by the way, with that 2020 model dial. Love the gradient. Man, that's the Pure Photography Award winner of the night. Chris T and his Rolex Daytona Oyster Flex hitting the road in his Lexus IS300T. Mark K innovates for Halloween with his Milgauss on a leather strap and his Audi A6 with ambient green. We've got George Y. Wows with his IWC Portuguese Perpetual bought from Justin S. at Watchbox. Thank you for trusting Justin and our company, George. Send your shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Let's see who's joining in. We've got more friends from Europe. We've got Luis Q. from Portugal. We've got C. Flynn from San Diego. Jacob Z. from Copenhagen. And then we've got William Malone. Newfoundland saying hello. Philip Lynn, hey Tim, would you get a Breguet 5177 Grand Faux or Tradition 7097 Retrograde Seconds? I love an animated dial. I'd go with the 7097 Retrograde Seconds, the only retrograde style that I find worthwhile because, let's face it, dates and hours are too easy to miss. With the seconds, there's always something happening on the dial. We got Callum Reed from Edinburgh. We've got Soma R from Budapest. Thank you, friends, from Edinburgh and Budapest. We've got Jamie O. from Malaga, Spain. Guys, thank you for joining me. And, of course, Watch Mamba from sunny SoCal. So, GPHG misses for 2021. Let's talk about the big three watches that could have been, should have been, and in my ideal world, would have been at the Oscars of watchmaking this year. So, the Grand Prix d'Horlogerie de Genève will take place this Thursday with its customary pomp, circumstance, and glamour. Danny Govberg, a member of the Academy, will be one of the judges. He's one of our Watchbox boys, so we give him a shout out there. But as with the real Academy Awards, the Oscars of watchmaking is as notable for its snubs and exclusions as for its nominees and ultimate winners. These are the watches that should have made the show in 2021, starting with a watch I think could have been a contender for the Aiguidor, basically best picture, best watch, 
the Patek Philippe 5236P, the inline perpetual calendar. This might be, along with the Breitling B09 Pistachio, my favorite new watch of the year. But unlike the Breitling, this is not a variation on an existing model. This is an all new blue sky, blue dial look at what a perpetual calendar watch should be from Patek. And though it is blue, it is sublime. Nominees, I should say, must be submitted first for consideration at the GPHG, and Patek will not play ball. They simply didn't submit the watch for consideration, therefore it can't be nominated even if everyone agrees it would be a runaway winner, and it would have fallback categories, like for example, the calendar category if it didn't win Aiguidor. This one should have been, could have been, and would have been a contender. And it wasn't always this way. Back in 2003, Patek submitted, and the 5101P 10-day tourbillon chronometer actually won the Aiguidor. And with a salmon dial and a white metal case, this thing was way ahead of its time. All the same, Patek is not a contender this year by choice. The Patek Fleet 5236P we should review because it came out much earlier in the year, getting everyone back up to speed. It's a 41.3 millimeter platinum perpetual calendar, a dress watch with an inline display. Now, while this is not the only inline display for a calendar system, Debatoon was there first in 2005 with the DBD, and of course, back in 2009, Roger Dubuis, of all companies, did an inline perpetual calendar. This is still a very big leap for Patek in terms of aesthetics and mechanics. Uh, it has a patented inline display that is all theirs, and unlike the Roger Dubuis version, which had frames around the day, the date, and the month, these are flush together as discs that rotate. It has a dial of blue gradient fade, satin finish with a vertical brushed steel-like pattern, an awesome look, and hey, Moser, you're not the only one who can rock a few may right there. Applique indices, spare baton style hands, super slick and symmetrical from side to side. This is a watch that frankly fires on all cylinders. And if lugs could kill, they certainly will with these vintage 3448 inspired kickers. Just look at them. Gorgeous. That's the 3448 perpetual calendar, and that's the 5236P. Let never be said that Patek does not honor or recognize its heritage. Caliber 31260 is a direct and welcome derivative of the fantastic 5235 regulator movement. As you can see, individual finger trains down to the escapement, micro rotor automatic with a platinum mass. And it's properly sized, handsomely shaped, and beautifully finished. Unlike so many Patek 240, 324, and 215 calibers, uh, this caliber actually looks like it was designed for the size of the case. It's bigger, broader, and no movement spacers are required. So for $130,110, it can be yours. And unlike a fistful of Patek sports watches, this complicated Calatrava actually looks like the six-figure machine it is. It would have been a real contender for several different awards, but I think it could have been the best among all and the Aguidor. Again, a lost opportunity. Moving on, not every watch needs to be Blue Sky Innovative to win at the GPHG. In fact, they have a category specifically for watches that are variations on well-worn themes. And I believe that the Rolex Oyster Perpetual 41, again, not entered by Rolex, could have been an outright winner in several categories. So for 2021, bring you up to speed, the near 90-year-old Oyster Perpetual gets a new 41-millimeter case, three-day power reserve, and colorful dials. And it is the color that sinks the charisma. That is the source of its power. It's not the bigger case, because the previous 39 millimeter case didn't sell well, and that had plenty of wrist presence. Oh, no, 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 no. It's the revival of the lacquered Stella style Rolex dials from the day dates in the 1970s and early 80s. The watch is 100 meters water resistant, shock resistant, anti magnetic, and as the entry level model in the Rolex catalog, a bit of an out of left field hit for Rolex. Keep in mind, this is a $5,900 Rolex watch, and that previous 39 millimeter watch was such a slow seller, you can still find them today for close to retail. No more. The OP41 is a big hit and a certain 
Dial, I should mention, is selling at over $21,000 pre-owned. Rolex nailed Tiffany Turquoise with that particular lacquer variant. And while Tiffany long ago burned its bridges to Rolex, Rolex isn't entirely intent on erasing that part of its history. It's a Tiffany dial that's not a Tiffany dial, if you get my drift. All right. The watch would have been a prohibitive favorite to win the GPHG Iconic category, a classification that appears to celebrate modestly revised versions of long existing watches. Rolex's corporate logic actually permits Tudor, the junior brand, to fly the flag at the GPHG, but the senior brand has always kept its distance, and that's truly unfortunate. See what you guys are saying right here. What is going on in the chat box? Cull Obsidian joining in from London saying hi to Tim and crew. We got Abdul from Germany joining in saying hey Orange, Thomas, Nefarion, Edward, Tim, Design. We got a regular group in here. You guys are friends and you're my buddies and I appreciate that. We've got Andrew McNeil joining in from Scotland. We've got Nefarion in the box, a longtime participant. Tim G, we've got of course Gold and Ghost, hi from St. Lucia. We've got... Neo, I nominate Thomas Burnett as the mayor of Watch YouTube until Blue Shirt returns. Blue Shirt Buddha, another one of our favorite. Nefarion saying these OPSs, these o Oyster Perpetuals are going for 20,000 now, crazy. It definitely is that. We've got Design Atelier, Eli Whitney, Mark S. from Brooklyn, Anthony Napolitano, and of course we've got Marco F. Weekly reminder, we want to see a Rolex on Tim Masso's wrist. Guys, I'm hearing you. I'm going to find a way to make this happen. I don't think Rolex is going to give me a freebie, but I love the Z Blue enough and the Day Date Oyster Quartz enough that I could actually spend my own money and this could happen. Maybe not this year, but early next. Let's think about it. The car was my priority. Now I have that. Soon the watch will follow. All right, jumping back into our regularly scheduled program, possibly the most important professional grade service issued mechanical watch of the last, well, let's say 21 years dating back to the millennium, the Omega Speedmaster Professional Moon Watch in an era when mechanical watches are delightful anachronisms for luxury buyers. This one is still used by a space agency and actually given as a flight certified article to professional space aviators. This moon watch remains the real deal. And for 2021, the moon watch gets its biggest inside outside reboot since before Apollo 11 flew. That's right, this is the biggest moon watch redesign since 1968. It's all new for 2021. Everything dial, bezel, bracelet, clasp, and yes, the movement. A new movement, guys. Dial, bezel, and bracelet, all of it echoing history when necessary, upgrading the hardware because NASA. And at $6,300, this Omega is more expensive than before, but still a good value. This isn't just some chronograph. It's Omega's icon and a piece of Americana, a real piece of American history as well as Switzerland's. But it won't have a chance to compete against these nominees for the GPHG Chronograph Prize. Okay, the Pistachio, the Zenith, the Tudor, those all belong there. And I'm even giving it to Louis Erard. Their ongoing collaboration with Silberstein is fun. But none of these things are life-saving equipment. None of these things have a heritage dating back over 50 years flying into and out of the atmosphere. None of these things have ever won the Silver Snoopy. All of which is to say, this Moonwatch, had it been entered by Omega, would have been guaranteed a win. Because like the Oyster Perpetual, it could have been entered in the Iconic category or the Petite Aiguille category based on price. That's right, both the OP41 and the Omega could have been in the price-sensitive Petite Aiguille category. And of course, we've got Chronograph, Iconic, Petite Aiguille, so many different ways for this watch to win. Heck, given its relevance and its redesign, it might even have been a contender for Aiguille d'Or because again, this is the real deal, not some sort of luxury article for armchair aviators. It's that too, but not exclusively. All right, guys, missed opportunities. Let me know in the description below, if you're watching this recorded, what were the big GPHG 2021 misses? Either because they weren't nominated or because their manufacturers didn't submit them. Jump into the box right here, Abdul R saying, I like the Schumacher Special Edition. I just wish they made a 100 meter water resistant version and 40 millimeter. How hard is that? We got Tim G saying, cheers to all. Mark S, Tim, I'm barely a car guy. Why a C5 Corvette? Why not a newer model? No 
it's the right combination of classic car and modern car. It's something I remember well from my formative years as a car enthusiast in high school. The C5 was always the American car that punched above its weight. Whether it was the 993 Porsche, the 996 Porsche, the Ferrari F355, the BMW M3, the C5 was always ready to have a go. It was a car you could pack with a fully assembled bike, maybe take off the wheel, maybe that's the only concession. You could throw a bike in the back, you could go on a road trip with it, great fuel economy, sterling performance, rugged, unbreakable, and if you want, easily modified to give epic performance. And one of the racing heroes of my formative years as a racing enthusiast, back when I saw Team Corvette at the 2001 Petit Le Mans, I got a picture and an autograph from Johnny O'Connell, Corvette and Racing Hall of Famer. That just made my year back in 2001, so I've got great memories memories of the car. It's as simple as a stove bolt and you can fix it with a screwdriver, which I've already done once. So that's why I picked the C5. It's a landmark Corvette. It's the car that saved the Corvette as a model. It's the reason we still have a C8 today. And again, it's just a great memory from way back when, but not unreliable in the way a 60s or 70s survivor can be. You don't have a sense of dread every time you start up a C5 that's been well maintained. You can actually drive it cross country and not expect to call AAA. That and a million other reasons, but I'll do a spot on my C5 when the time comes. Okay, now let's talk about viewer wrist shots number two because as ever we have your analog on my digital and you submitted some great shots. Dylan A stuns with this shot, or Dylan L, sorry, Dylan, you're a long timer, I know your name, stuns with this shot of his IWC pilot's watch Spitfire split seconds chronograph. Well done. Such lighting. Great shadow, too. Robert E. gears up for watches tonight in good taste, with Tudor and some serious scotch. JC from Portugal strikes a classical wrist pose with his vintage 1968 Zenith Defi A3642. And Tom B. proves that lightning strikes twice with another late 60s heirloom, his A3642 Zenith Defi, this time on a strap. MM shares this spectacular shot of his Submariner and Santa Anita horse racing track. You guys are getting really sharp with the camera phones. Looking good, dudes. Keep them coming. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Question from M squared is a VC47040 a good buy? I love those older overseas, so I'm going to say yes. Again, it's a better buy if you get it fully documented, box papers, never refinished, either a blue or a salmon dial, an original factory tritium. But there's something to be loved about a sub 8 millimeter thick chronometer certified overseas, and they're still 150 meters water resistant. I really like those old 37 millimeter overseas. All right, guys, right here. New sports watches, late 2021 and early 2022. We are in that neither world between this model year and the next one. This is the time of year when you typically start seeing pre-SIHH stuff. But since that's basically dead, people just release stuff willy-nilly, leaving you to guess whether it's early 2022 or trailing 2021. So, let's start. Twice divorced Aston Martin, having ditched JLC, dubiously, and Tag Heuer, a good move, announced its Gerard Perigo partnership earlier this year, and shortly thereafter, a tourbillon edition of 18 pieces followed. Now that's based on the Neo Bridge's three, three bridge tourbillon. Nice, but the Neo Bridge is not a new model. This is a variation on a theme, and frankly, there's not a whole lot here that screams Aston Martin to me. It's basically something they were already making. Well, they've in some ways made amends by at least making the Gerard Perigo Laureato chronograph Aston Martin distinct. That's green. British racing cars are green. Aston Martin racing cars are green. See where I'm going with this? Easy to see, easy to understand. And they're telegraphing their 2021-ness with a dial that would be on vogue even if it had nothing to do with the folks from, I guess it's not Newport Pagnell anymore. It's, it's Gaydon. I think that's where their cars are made these days. But I digress. 41 millimeters stainless steel, a 188-piece limited edition with a green dial. And it is a vibrant cross-hatched green dial with nickel anthracite accents. It's said to be Aston Martin Racing Green, which I find somewhat doubtful. As a longtime observer of sports car racing, the actual Aston Martin Racing Green, seen here on the DBR1, 
has blue undertones that I don't sense. This style from GP seems more like a metallic take on Kelly Green than Aston Martin Racing Green, but that's okay, because I like Green, I like GP, and I love Aston Martin. This dial from GP is a lovely piece and you get a manufacturer movement on the opposite side. It's good on both sides. You get some custom case back work, Aston Martin and the winged logo, silk screened, and a base that is built on the 3300 platform. So thin, fine, and handsome, but as you can see, distinctly poorly sized for that case. But redeeming features, 100 meters water resistant, this is a real sports watch, and a rare 904L steel sighting that's not a Rolex. $18,100 is the asking price, but this is GP after all, so I sense that even in the year of the green dial and the steel integrated bracelet sports watch, there should be some discount to be negotiated. Wait for them pre-owned and get an even bigger discount, because that's just the way of the world. Okay, see what you guys are saying right here. Jumping into the box and all the way down. We have Reza asking, Tim, is there a correlation between the rise of prices in real estate and the rise of Rolexes and Pateks and FP Journs? Banks have stopped paying interest, so money goes elsewhere. Yeah, I think you kind of answered your own question. Cheap money, easy money from central banks, and it's taken all of a decade for it to find its way into weird investment tangents like NFTs, cryptocurrency, yes, real estate, but also highly risky speculative stocks. Like there's no reason Tesla should be trading at over 100 times forward earnings. There's no rational reason based on their profitability, their market share, or their sales volumes. And the same thing is true of watches. That money, finding nothing to love in the world of interest rates, is seeking other opportunities, and some of them are silly, which is why you see people paying four or even $500,000 for a 5711 that retails for $34,890. And it's not just the Nautilus, it's many, many other watches. It's almost like the Russian Matryoshka dolls, where you have the Nautilus, which is insanely overpriced, then behind that, you've got the Royal Oak Jumbo. Then behind that, you've got the Vacheron Overseas. Then behind that, you have like the Moser Streamliner. And eventually, I guess you get down to like a Laureato or a BR05 from Bell & Ross. Okay. High horology and boutique horology coincide with Long und Heine, which steps into the ring with its first sports watch, the Hector. Uh, who and what is Long und Heine? Well, they are an ultra haute horlogerie brand from Dresden, founded by their namesakes, neither one of which remains involved, though Jens Schneider from Moritz Grossmann is now capably in control. But you can see this watch that they made with bridges and plates constructed of petrified mammoth ivory. Yes, and you can see hand engraved rose gold plates for the numbering as well as the nameplate. Blued screws, black polish, this is the stuff of dreams. And they make about 60 to 100 watches a year, so the volume is low. Note the diamond capstone, by the way, on the balance staff. So the Hector, which is their sports watch, is 40 millimeters in stainless steel, 50 meters water resistant, and full bracelet, as you can see. You can see there's a little bit of a flanking wing design that's reminiscent of the well-known sports watch from Patek Philippe, as well as the lesser-known sports watch from Patek, the Aquanaut. And Lang und Heine features a far better bracelet integration. And you can see Lang und Heine has done a good job blending the bracelet to the lug profile far better than the Odysseus, which is the sort of mini rival to Lang und Heine from the considerably larger Alango und Zona. There is no relation between the two, though they are geographically proximate. But I have my own reservations about the compromises made to hit the 16,900 euro price of this watch. That's not the kind of price you typically associate with the stuff from Dresden. It tends to be high five and then well into the six figures. And this is a company that is never played in this price point and rarely plays in the steel realm. I should say that Lang und Heine's standard finish used to be this. Lang und Heine made incredible things. This is literally best in the world. You, d you cannot get any better. Could Fernand Berthoud, Grubel Forcy, Philippe Dufour match it? Sure, but nothing surpasses this. If I could wear a watch upside down, it would be that. And if you ask me who makes the best finished watch in the world, this is going to be in my top three, regardless of the other top two. But here's the deal. The UWD caliber in the Hector looks like this. 
Now, it's made in-house by Long und Heine's subsidiary, UWD, which is a movement manufacturer that supplies movements to, among others, Zinn and J.N. Shapiro watches. But though this is good, it's not this nice. And there's a big gap. And I worry about that from a branding and brand equity standpoint. Without the German taxes, it's a little bit difficult to disentangle the German price and the Euro price from what it would cost in the US because of taxes, VAT, things like that. But it might cost somewhere around $15,000 US. Compromises have to be made. Uh, dial detail is good, but it's not haute horlogerie. That's good, but I've seen dials like this on watches costing well under $10,000. And water resistance is just 50 meters. I don't know whether they're advising swimming with this watch, but I would say don't, because 50 meters in general, even with the screw down crown, is super borderline. And also challenging is the fact that this is a manual wind 48 hour power reserve. If you're gonna have a sports watch that's manual wind, it's nice to give people days, not hours of power reserve. And two days in 2021 just isn't gonna do it. Uh, this is gonna be a little bit of a pain. It should be something that's an occasional pleasure, not a constant necessity. That said, you do have some options, as three dials will be available. Trendy stuff, blue, gray, and ain't it 2021 green with a fascinating e-crew sort of fotina. I love the shape of the hands. I'm just not sure this is a watch that does justice to Long und Heine, a company that makes at most 100 watches a year, and they're making 33 of each version of this. So again, questions remain open. Good idea, too many compromises, is the price right? Will this be a success? Who knows, but I look forward to having one in my studio for reviews. And if Long Wound Hina happens to be at Dubai Watch Week, I will be reporting from the floor of the show. All right, let's see what's going on. Thomas Burnett, I like the Laureato, but this collaboration doesn't do it for me. Edward Ledden saying for Laureato, that is the wrong color. We got Rohit R asking, Tim, what are your thoughts on the 5296G001? I like it a lot. The 5296G sector dial in white gold is probably the best looking version of that watch. If we're honest, everyone loves that thing. And when it comes on the market, it sells fast. We never have that around for very long in either rose or white gold. When it's in stock, we usually find a buyer within a few hours. So I like it and apparently so does the rest of the world. We got Wayne Hu, is it worth to upgrade the 3861, the new moon watch caliber, or try to find a new old stock 1861? If you're going for a display case back, a sapphire sandwich, get the old movement. There used to be two movements. There was the 1863 for this, the display case back moon watch, and then the 3861. Now, if you've already got a closed case back moon watch, I don't recommend you upgrade. But if you're shopping the new moon watch and the older moon watch, I say, Find the 1863. Don't bother with the 1861 because the 63 was beautiful, genuinely gorgeous. And the display case back and solid case back versions of the current new generation moon watch use the same movement. It's sort of a compromise between the old solid case back and old display case back. The old 1863 did the best impression I've ever seen of hand finished bevels on a mass produced watch. It is genuinely worthwhile to find and to buy at a premium. All right, what else is going on in the box right here? We've got a lot of discussion going on. I'm trying to follow the discussions you're having between each other, and I'm not always able to find the antecedent comments. Then we have Abdul saying, the Chapek makes an excellent sports watch, and I saw the Retropont, the split second from the Antarctique collection at Watch Time New York, and I was afraid at 42.5 and non-round it would be too big, but it wears like a 41 or even a 40. I say buy with confidence if you're considering that watch. We got Justin D saying, tired of luck sports watches, instead look for BBWs, big beautiful watches like the Omega Plo Prof and kick butt dress watches like the Brigade Traditions. And the 7027, in terms of finish, and scarcity is the best kept secret in modern high horology dress watches. SE asking 6119G or 6119R. G. I like white metals, but if you like a little bit more warmth, you might prefer rose gold, so don't take that at face value. Go with your heart, not mine. We got Matthias L. Tim, I'm being offered a Patek 5960 stainless steel new old stock 2021 date. What are your thoughts on the piece? If you're being offered a, 59, a 5960 1A, it's not 2021 date. That was discontinued a few years ago. So it might be warranted as of 2021, 
I would make sure that your authorized dealer fills out that warranty card for you so you get the warranty. Thoughts on that piece? Buy with confidence. One of my favorite Patek Philippe's of the last 20 years, a surefire investment piece. If it's the black dial, which was made for only a couple of months between 2017 and 2018, man, you cannot lose. That's a great watch. Power reserve, automatic, annual calendar, flyback chronograph, 40. 0.5 millimeters in steel with integrated bracelet. My goodness, it's fully loomed. What more do you want? Do you need me to tell you to run, don't walk to buy that thing? Because someone else will and right out from under you. All right, let's talk a little bit about Romain Gautier. High Horology, Valet du Jeu, usually one of those brands I would mention alongside Long Untaina and Philippe Dufour and Grubel Forcy and Fernand Bertou as the best finish in the business. They enter the sports watch arena after years of acclaim with dress watches. This is their first, it's called the Continuum Titanium Edition 1. 41 millimeters, titanium, a series of 28 pieces. We have, as you can see right there, a faceted bezel that links this design to many others extant for decades. Water resistance again will be 50 meters and I just don't think that's enough, but the dial is loomed and it has an integrated rubber strap so that's kind of cool but at 50 millimeters roughly speaking lug to lug with an integrated strap it's going to be a little stiff and wear large even though it's only 11 millimeters thick also guys the press release needs some serious proofreading Romain what is that a morbid Halloween season joke guys they're dead and buried get that out of there but I would also say the price is intriguing because at 37,000 Swiss francs or roughly 40,000 US, this is close to half the price of Romain Gautier's lowest priced watch. Now this really tells on the caliber, I don't know if we can go full screen here, but the caliber is another manual wind in a sports watch, 60 hours this time and far too much text on the bridges. I hope that's revised before these things make production. It's good by the standards of this price range, but Romain Gautier movements like the Logical One have laid down a tough marker to match, much less beat. Plus, you can see this Insight Micro Rotor proves Romain Gautier can do the same with virtuosity and finishing automatic watches, and I can't shake the feeling that this movement should have been adapted for the sports watch rather than a manual. The first Romain Gautier sports watch feels to me a bit like the 2003 Porsche Cayenne, a project designed to trade some compromises of the underlying brand image in exchange for financial security and market share. And the Cayenne certainly did that right up to the point that, well, Porsche was gobbled up by Volkswagen in 2008. But that to me is why the continuum as it is at this price is in the catalog. I hope to be proven wrong though, because everything we've seen so far has been a rendering and renderings of hand finished watches always stink. They're always warmer, more charismatic, more lovable in person. And I'm gonna hold off on this because Romain Gautier is not a compromising man. His brand has set an incredible standard and I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt until I actually see this thing in the titanium. All right, viewer wrist shots number three. I asked you answered your wrist on my list starting with Albert W who scales the heights of Manhattan in New York City with his Glasuta Original Panamatic Lunar. Looking good. Eddie S of Sweden is on vacation in sunny Spain with his Gerard Perigo Laureato and by the way and here is the background architecture for your enjoyment. That is the best of the old world. Guys, keep them coming. Jacob M. of Australia treats us to a shot of his ball night train, an APR-tuned Audi S3, a rolling riot, a man after my own Audi loyal heart. Seriously, I've, I've got Quattro tattooed on my ventricles. Simon H. and his Rolex Yachtmaster go long on a flight from Zurich to San Francisco with his steel and platinum Rolex Yachtmaster. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your watch on this box. All right, now, the most memorable copycat watches through the years. Clone Wars, you better believe it. Though in some cases, these watches are so disparate in time frame and price point that they're more like ships in the night than a Clone War. So let's start with the 2021 Zenith Chronomaster Sport because it's so fresh in our memory. This thing came out on January 22nd and the father of the design is, well, anyone's guess. 
Everyone figured that out right up front. Hugely controversial out of the gate because it looks so much like the famous Genevois Sports Chronograph. This Zenith Chronomaster Sport already looks like a smart gamble and an unqualified success for Zenith. Even used examples of this watch are selling for pretty close to list price, and I cannot remember the last Zenith powered watch that achieved that accolade. In fact, it was probably the Zenith powered Rolex Daytona back in the 90s. Selling for the same or more used waiting lists at dealers? Zenith. This is a new old world. It's good to be back, isn't it? All right, let's talk about what you do if you want more. Check out my collector's guide. Open up a different window. Keep me streaming. But I did a side-by-side, -side, highly produced, beautifully narrated, and thanks to Sean, beautifully photographed comparison of these two watches with full tech, spec, and opinion, plus wrist shots. Check out Watchbox Reviews and my collector's guide, Zenith Chronomaster Sport. All right, now let's turn back the clock from the most recent to the most distant, 1962 and the Vacheron Constantin 6782 Thunderbird. Vacheron, well, Rolex also inspires high horology brands. It's not just Zenith. Uh, Rolex inspired this one with their Datejust Turnograph, and that's a 6609, and you can see that one courtesy of Christie's. Very similar to what Vacheron hath wrought. Can we jump back to the Turnograph or the Thunderbird? That's the 6782 by Vacheron, and once again, the inspiration is clear. But these two watches, at such disparate price points, selling in such different volume, no one's going to get on anyone's case, even in the city of Geneva, where they're both based. And the Vacheron was built in fewer than 100 pieces between about 1962 and 1972. So this is a rare score if you can find one. And I should mention that this was one of the first Vacheron automatics ever to receive the Geneva Hallmark. It featured the 1072K based on a JLC 800 series automatic, but significantly upgraded in tech, spec, and finish. This was a landmark movement in a landmark watch. And if you're lucky enough to have the opportunity to own one, buy it. It's a milestone and an investment watch, one of the first Vacheron sports watches with its rotating bezel, and prices remain reasonable compared to what you're going to pay for, I don't know, a 1970s Nautilus 3700 or even a 222 from Vacheron. This is a fantastic take on a Rolex, well done at the highest level. There's room for both in your collection. Now, Fast forward to 1977, Vacheron's added again with the Model 222, so named because it celebrated 222 years of the oldest continuously operating watch brand in Switzerland. The 222, yes, it emulates Gerald Genta's Royal Oak and Nautilus, but more than that, it emulates some of his lesser heralded designs from the 70s, like the Jumbo Ingenieur reference 1832 from IWC. Jumping back between the two, you could see that Lug bracelet, bezel, there's a lot of similarities there. And frankly, if we want to turn back the clock to 1970, the rarely attributed but very much Gerald Genta Rolex 5100 Beta 21 also bears a close resemblance to the later and admittedly much thinner and finer 222. But there's nothing wrong with that. Jörg Heisick was reasoning that if you're going to borrow, borrow from the best. And back then, Gerald Genta was the best. And while Jörg Heisick has basically been the watchmaker's Ercole Spada, Spada is sometimes known as the master of the weird in car design circles, this is probably the all-time high watermark of Heisick's career and one of the all-time great Vacherons of any era description or product category. It's a great Vacheron sports watch, and it's a great 70s sports watch all at once. So, 500 pieces in steel, 120 in two-tone, 100 in gold. This is a rare watch, more so than any A-series 5402 from Audemars Piguet. A real collector's piece, you can still find them in steel, sometimes even with the rare salmon dial for around $30,000. Don't miss that opportunity, guys. 37 millimeters, Geneva Hallmark, automatic winding, and delightful. All right. The 2005 Hublot Big Bang. This is going to be controversial because I told you I'd programmed a watch nerd show today, and it seems watch nerds will never make their peace with Hublot. Apart from the 2% of Hublot watches from their high horology masterpiece division, uh, the watch connoisseur generally doesn't style himself as an Hublot guy, but it was the ultimate watch connoisseur and collector, Jean Claude Biver, who came out of retirement in the early 2000s at the invitation of Hublot founder Carlo Croco. He said, You will have 
equity. You will have partnership and you will have a piece of the gate. I will make you CEO. I will put you in charge if you can revive this brand. Kroko, who founded Hublot as MDM Genève in 1980, was looking for an exit strategy. And in Jean-Claude Biver, veteran of Blancpain and Omega, he found his ace. So, there's no question how this particular bang got so big. Biver drew on a well-known oversized luxury sports watch from the period as the mid-2000s was the heyday of the Royal Oak Offshore. Its commercial high point, without a doubt, was right around 2005. But here's the thing. Hublot had such a low profile in the early to mid-2000s, and the price point of this watch was so much lower than AP that they were able to keep the folks from Les Brasseux and their lawyers at bay. Biver's commercial instincts were at their peak in this era. I feel like he lost his magic touch sometime around the point he became the chief of Tag Heuer. But back in the mid to late 2000s, he, would, he was at his peak. It was like watching Barishnikov dance or Michael Phelps swim. It was virtuosity in action. And he created a groundswell, a volcanic groundswell, of, of demand for this watch. An absolute explosion, or one might even say big bang of interest that swelled volumes, profits, gave Croco his exit strategy and ultimately led to fistfuls of money from LVMH being thrown at Croco and Biver. This was the watch that made Hublot what it is today. Not just the go-to for a big and extravagant sports watch, but a survivor. Back in the early 2000s, there was no guarantee that Hublot was going to see the second decade of this century. That's the watch that made it happen. All right, another infamous recent memory. From 2019, we're speeding up and taking the Wayback Machine somewhat less far back to 2019 and the Chopard Alpine Eagle. At face value, there's so much to love. 41 millimeters a unique hardened stainless steel that's tough to scratch, uh, COSC chronometer certification, 100 meter water resistance, a high horology manufacturer caliber from a boutique brand, and a dial with detail to weaken the knees, all with a retail price of $12,800. So what's not to like? Well, as it turned out, Chopard was skewered for borrowing way too much from a familiar face. And that's a little bit unfair, as this Chopard does have roots dating back to 1980. Now, that St. Moritz of 1980 was derivative even in its day. But I digress. This is a watch that had a real purchase on Chopard's history. It was the timing and the choice of the blue dial that made people cynical. That said, I think the Alpine Eagle is one of the most underrated watches available today. I really think it is a great buy. You can find it for $2,000 under retail, still under warranty as a used watch, and I wouldn't bat an eye about paying that price for it. Heck, $12,800, I think it's fairly priced new. And I should mention the 2021 version, 8 hertz escapement and titanium is even better. See what's going on in the box right here. See what you guys are saying. I know we're not going to have a lot of fans of Hublot here, but we got Neferion saying, now I do like the Alpine Eagle very much. We've got Jim Millet saying, I like the Chopard. We have Neferion saying, people would complain even if it didn't have the screws. Mark S saying, I hate the Roman numeral dial. Your ship has come in. Most of those, except for the 12, have been eliminated on the new titanium version, which does away with them and replaces them with standard indices on a gray dial. So Chopard has, has answered just as you have asked. And then right here we have Lamb saying, I tried the Alpine Eagle. Somehow it didn't feel as good on the wrist as it looked in photos. And that's the exact opposite of my experience. I saw it at Dubai Watch Week in 2019 and I thought, hmm, this isn't so bad. I actually kind of like this. So your miles may vary. We've got Swiftus Maximus asking, screws on the face though? Mm, it's always going to be the bone of contention there. A lot of folks think that is a path too far. But we're not done. We're going back to the future and we're going back to 2021. We are in the moment now. And we're talking about the 2021 Breitling Premier B25 Daytora 42. Guys, this is a gorgeous watch. 42 millimeters with a salmon dial, seriously cool. But some people faulted this watch for its obviously derived style, as we all know where this design came from. And yes, Patek's $205,810 perpetual calendar chrono donated a ton of cues to the $12,950 Daytora. And if we just jump back, Sean, to show those two side by side, I mean, that's pretty blatant. But when you're talking about a price difference, that's, you know, 
almost 20 fold, who can really complain? Plus, let's, let's go back one more time, if we can. We're, we're wearing out the switcher there. The Breitling, as you can see, is loomed. That adds value. And I should mention, if you're gonna borrow, once again, just borrow or steal outright from the best, and Patek is the best. No one's gonna confuse this value automatic powered Breitling B25 with the 5270P that came out in 2018. That's the best version of the 5270. And I should say the B25 after the pistachio is the second best version of the Breitling Premier line. That said, folks who want the most original Breitling design of the year are going to get exactly that, the pistachio B09. No date, manual wind, 40 millimeter pistachio dial. Mm, my favorite ice cream and my favorite color. Sign me up. Okay, jumping into the box, see what else you guys are saying right here. We've got Edward Ledden saying, good artists copy, great artists steal. That's actually a fact. And then we have Mark S saying, Breitling has better hands than that Patek Philippe. I actually agree with you on that. That's a really good point. It's subtle, but it's there. And then right here we have Niels saying, I'm tired of salmon dials. It's a bit overdone at this point. You're right, but then again, we've got green dials now, and that's the next thing to be overdone. So guys, if you're watching, tell me in the description below, what is the next fad dial gonna be? Are we gonna see green for another model year, or will it be something else, perhaps gold, perhaps brown, perhaps millennial pink now that my generation gets some actual money and can pony up at the dealer? You guys let me know. But I asked, you answered, viewer wrist shots number four. Chris K is hard at work with his Breitling Colt 44 diving chronometer, an underrated and now discontinued line. Spencer C captures the magic of his Breitling Super Ocean Heritage 2 with a cup of coffee. Breitling theme, I like it guys. Christian H of Miami showcases his Rolex Air King with a mechanically literate friend. Hey there, Optimus Prime. Ted D of Minnesota reports from the big game with a rare full bracelet 50 fathoms bathyscaphe, and Mark takes us home and celebrates his birthday with his Parmigiani Tonda GT. Congratulations, Mark, on your birthday. Make it your best year yet, and thank you for thinking outside the box. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Next week, we will be reacting to the GPHG. Guys, let me know in the description below what are your favorites to win the categories. Timeout, Tim out. Sean on the switcher out, and thanks for logging on.